Welcome to episode 75 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast, Preventing Elopement and Wandering in Nursing Homes. The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia attorneys Rob Shank and Will Smith. Hello and welcome. My name is Rob Shank. And I'm Will Smith. And we have an a, a fantastic episode for you today. A lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, the 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 crux of the episode is going to be talking about um, residents that are in danger of elopement and wandering, and what those terms mean, and and what the implications are when those things happen. Um, we are not doing it alone this week. We have a guest with us. The guest is Gene Saunders, the CEO of Project Lifesaver International. Uh, Will, can you tell us a little bit more about, sure. about Gene Saunders? Yeah, so um, Chief Gene Saunders is the founder and CEO of Project Lifesaver International, the leading organization in special needs search and rescue. Gene began his public service as a U.S. Army Ranger followed by service with the Virginia State Guard, and throughout his career, he continued to hold positions in which he could serve others. Upon completing uh, his duties with the military, he became a police officer with the Chesapeake Police Department uh, in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. A career path he followed until a decision to take on Project Lifesaver full-time during his retirement from the force as a captain after 33 years of dedicated service uh, to his country and uh, to his state of Virginia. During that time, he founded the department's SWAT team, which he commanded for 23 years, and served as the commanding officer of the Training Academy Vice and Narcotics, Criminal Investigations, and Special Investigations. In the nearly 20 years since retiring, Gene has grown what started as a localized pilot program to an international non-profit organization responsible for more than 3,400 special needs rescues. So he's got quite um, a resume behind him, uh, and they do very good work. Um, <clears throat> Chief Saunders, nice to meet you. I'm Will Smith. Thank you. I appreciate being here this morning. Where were you in Virginia, by the way? Uh, Chesapeake, Virginia, which uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, part of a five-city uh area norfolk virginia beach chesapeake portsmouth and suffolk i got all right there in the mid-atlantic i was stationed in norfolk virginia for about four years that's why i was asking yeah well we butt right up next to norfolk in fact i you know lived in norfolk up until the time i went on the police department and uh, graduated from high school in norfolk outstanding so um do us do us a favor and explain what project lifesaver is well, uh, Project Lifesaver is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that uh, I founded back in 1999. And it actually was a result of, of failure. Uh, I was a commanding officer of special operations with, in Chesapeake Police Department, which was uh, consisted of search and rescue and SWAT. And we were finding we were having a lot of uh, missions to search for wandering Alzheimer's patients. And we were, frankly, not very successful. Uh, having learned of wildlife tracking, I felt it could be adapted. To make a long story short, we were able to do that. And it consists of training law enforcement or public safety agencies in being able to place these transmitters with at-risk persons who may wander off. These bracelets uh, emit a radio signal on a set frequency each person having their own frequency, and the trained personnel can come in with receivers, locate that signal, track to it, uh, pick up the person, and take them back to where they wandered from. And and what exactly is elopement or, or wandering uh, by these Alzheimer patients? Well, you know, I, I hear the term elopement and wandering, and we actually coined another phrase that a lot of uh, organizations are starting to pick up on. Because in our opinion, uh, they're not actually eloping or wandering. They have developed a mission. (laughs) That's true. Now, what is that mission? Well, that mission may be something in their past. They need to go to work. They need to pick up the kids. They need to go to the store. They need to go home. And home is not where they're currently at. 
So that mission becomes a driving force for them to get from where they are to where they want to be. Problem is, when they get out, everything is not or is unfamiliar to them. Uh, They get disoriented, and rather than doing what would be considered normal behavior and turning around and coming back, they continue to move forward and usually end up getting in trouble or somewhere where they can't extract themselves. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, we we hear a lot of stories of, of these elderly residents uh, that get out and end up, you know, passing away because they're not found until um, days later, and they're not equipped to survive out on their own like that, are they? No, no, they're not. And, you know, you're going against the clock because 24 hours is what we look at as to the time that they need to be found. After that, the uh, chances of recovering them and bringing them home safely go down dramatically. I would have thought it'd be much, uh, much less than that. So, twenty-four hours is is usually a window where you have a, a higher probability of bringing the the resident back unharmed. Well, safely. I'm not going to say unharmed. They may incur some injury, but as far as fatality, normally, and I use that term loosely, mm-hmm. uh, normally. Uh, Within 24 hours, you can most likely locate them and bring them back safely. Now, that doesn't take into account if they've gotten into um, some natural environment, which is going to cause them harm. Right. And so what? What's do you have an understanding as to the amount of time that a facility um, goes, well, f- figures out that a resident has gone on a mission? to the time where they can use the device to get a location? Well, normally we have found uh, that a lot of the studies and the ones we've participated in and even helped initiate uh, have proven somewhat correct in that the person usually is located within a mile of the point last seen. So if a facility or an agency can get on the scene as quickly as possible, and when I say that, we've initiated searches four and five hours later and still been highly successful. It increases the chance of getting them quicker because they won't have covered as much ground. Now, this doesn't take into account if they get into a car or catch a bus or something of that nature. But, you know, usually within an hour or two, they, they've got a real good chance of recovering them quickly. Sure. Um, so... You you talk about the, the getting into you know natural environments. What 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 kind of environments have you found in your experience with this organization have been the most dangerous? So in in other words, is it more dangerous to have a facility next to a wooded area, an interstate, um, you know, a swimming pool, these type of things? What what are what's all of the above? Yeah, <laughs> and and I, I don't say that in jest, but uh, gotcha, to answer your yeah. question, it's all of the above. Mm-hmm. The problem is they can get into trouble quickly in any one of those areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Woods, they can get into, uh, get disoriented, go in circles, become tired, sit down, uh, or fall down, or get into some uh, vegetation that they get caught up in and can't move. A pool, of course, is dangerous if they fall in it and they can't extract themselves from it. Interstates, of course, are going to be dangerous. Because as they walk out there, especially if it's in the nighttime hours, who knows what may happen there. So there is no, and, and I would say no absolutely safe environment for a place to be. Uh, uh, people that, that go out on these kind of missions, they can get into trouble quickly regardless of where they're at. Hmm. And what kind of, um, you know, I would imagine that you've probably been in the three decades that you've you've been serving our country and serving um the state of virginia you've dealt with you know people who were missing uh, of all ranges so what makes the the elderly especially those with dementia or alzheimer's more challenging or different well for the first thing you know they don't react or behave in what we would say a normal situation Uh, They're going to do things differently. They're not going to help you find them. They're not going to react to calling their name. 
they're going to be in places where many searchers, and I was guilty of it before I started this program, would call locations that a reasonable person would not go. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to understand that they're not thinking in a reasonable manner. Uh, we located a man in a, a briar thicket. Oh, uh, wow. We've located them in uh, abandoned uh, tobacco fields in a driving rain covered with mud where it was actually said, had it not been for the equipment, nobody would have ever seen the person. Yeah, uh, We found them in bushes, in vegetation, in water, under overpasses, in fault ceilings, under houses. No. Uh, so you're not... You can't say that when you search for a person that has dementia that you are conducting a search for what we would call a reasonable person and would expect them to react in that way. Yeah, is there a do? You, is there a common in, in your in your experience? Is there a common mechanism for the the beginning of the mission? So, for example, a door left open, perhaps another resident has let them out, perhaps they've figured out how to get out themselves. Um, that kind of thing. What What is the common scenario in which a resident, particularly one with, with um, you know, cognition issues, uh, goes on a mission? Well, probably the most common denominator I've seen is they start expressing a desire to do so. Mm. You know, and a what, door open certainly makes it easy. Uh, can they figure out how to get out? Absolutely. I've seen them figure out cipher locks. I've mm. seen them break windows out. I've seen them force doors. Uh, you know, I use the analogy that if uh, people weren't capable of escaping from where they want to be, we wouldn't have prison breaks. It's true, uh, sir. And I think a lot of a lot of people make the mistake of figuring that if a person has dementia, that they don't have this reasoning ability. Well, there are times when they absolutely do and can utilize it. I, I think, and what we found. Uh, in a lot of instances and have started passing and have been passing this on, listen to what they're saying, uh, because they're going to start sending you signals, uh, such as I need to go home. Well, you know, reasoning with them that they are home is not effective because in their mind, they're not. You gotta, as you know, and you, uh, I'm sure you have seen, they're 30 years, 20 years, 10 years in the past. And that's where they're thinking they need to be. Right. Or I need to go to work. Okay, it doesn't matter that they retired 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. In their mind, they're 30 years in the past and they need to go to work. So you need to start paying attention to that because they're going to get active during those times that they are, are thinking about these things that they want to do. Um, so an open door or any of those kind of things it makes it easy of course so but if they want out bad enough they're going to get out yeah so, so you need to pay attention to them right and so so the for our listeners out there who have a loved one in an in a nursing home this some of the signs um that there's a potential um, for a mission is that the loved one is expressing a desire to go to work Go pick up the kids. Yeah. Um, complete the grocery list. These type of things. Is there anything else? Any other symptoms in your experience that, uh, if a person's listening to this, they can look out for and observe to prevent this? Well, yeah, they become restless and uncomfortable with their surroundings. Mm -hmm. I would pay attention to that. Okay. Yeah, because they, that's when the mind starts taking them to other places. Yeah, I, I and I, I like the fact that we need to remember to give these these people credit. Um, they'll figure out if they don't want to be there how to get out. Um, yes, they will. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, when I first started, I had uh, our team sit in a uh, Alzheimer's locked uh, wing of a nursing home for eight hours, and we picked up on a lot of behaviors. Yeah, probably not all, but over the years we've learned a few more. But you know, you've got the greeter. We call them the greeter. Mm -hmm. The person visits coming through a locked area, and you have the greeter standing there to tell them, hello, how are you, have a nice day. And people don't realize this person is a patient. Right. And they're holding the door for them. So what happens? They just walk right on out. Right. <laughs> uh, I have seen, personally seen one that figured out a cipher lock. I sat right there and watched them. That's amazing. You know, did, they, did it bother them that I was watching? No. 
yeah. quiet because they, their mission was to get out. They didn't care who saw it. Yeah. Uh, so these are the kind of things you, you probably need to pay attention to. Well, I'm I'm curious now, uh, Chief Saunders. Why why did you get involved in this? Why did you um, start this? Well, you know, as a commander of a search and rescue, and being unsuccessful in locating some of these people, and having to inform families that you know we are suspending the search because we can't locate them, or yes, we've located them. However, you know, the, yeah. things like that started to bother me, and. Uh, I just kept thinking there had to be a better way to do this. There had to be a more logical way to do this. Something that didn't cause the strife, the stress, that didn't cost the, the taxpayers money. Because these searches could get very expensive, very large, very manpower intense over a period of time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. I, and I've always had the feeling uh, or felt like th- this this is something that I wanted to do to be able to reunite these people with their families. Because let's face it, somebody goes off on a mission or wanders, whatever term you want to use. Uh, people are devastated by that. First off, they don't know where their loved one is, which is a loss of control. And having that kind of feeling that they have no control or no ability to uh, bring the person back or know where they are, you know, that's devastating in itself. And then to have a, uh, a tragic ending is even more devastating because then the questions start arising. What could I have done or what should I have done? Or did I do something wrong? And no, they didn't really do anything wrong, but uh, I just didn't like those outcomes. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, what does a facility or, or family need to do to qualify? How do they? Um, how do how do these facilities get a hold of you? How do they they get your program? Well, they can you know. And when you say facilities, yes, we do have a number of facilities that are members uh, by by themselves. Sure, and, and we call we call them a closed cell because they operate within their own premises and just outside of their premises, which I think is great. Uh, they can contact us through our website, which is uh, you know projectlifesaver.org. Uh, they can call us uh, 757-546-5502. Um, we will walk them through the process of what it takes to get trained and get the equipment. Uh, and then the families, if they're within those facilities, of course, they can go through the facility if they're not. They can go to our website and click on where we are. Uh, they can look at that, and if their area is covered by Project Lifesaver, they can contact us, or they can contact the agency that is conducting the program and get their uh, loved one enrolled. Gotcha. Chief Saunders, can you actually describe the equipment? Like, what's available? And, like, can you hook it up to an app? Like, what's it look like? What part of the body does it go to? That kind of thing. Well, it's a wristband or an ankle band. You know, it depends on how the person wants to wear it. We've been inventive in, in finding other ways for persons that may be sensitive and didn't want to wear them. It is a small plastic case that houses a transmitter and a battery. The transmitter operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 60 days before the battery needs to be changed. It's sending out a pulse radio transmission, uh, which is picked up by a receiver that is tuned to a frequency band that we are authorized to operate in. Now, no, we do not have an app. We do not use, uh, you know, smartphones. And why? Because one of the things I have found in doing this, the most reliable technology out there is the old simple radio direction finding. Really? Very little interferes with it. Uh, You don't have problems, you know, with electrical storms, washing it out or uh, heavy cloud cover or if they go inside somewhere the signal is lost that signal is going to emanate constantly and it's just a matter of the what we train these people to do and their methods to lock onto that signal and, and then locate the person um, we're always looking at other technology and how it might benefit but to date and i've gone on record many times to say 
you know, just tracking that simple radio signal is the most effective technology out there for doing this in this particular situation. That's interesting. I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have figured that, but you know, I, technology is always breaking down in my experience. Oh yeah, so. I can't get my Tom Tom to 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 get my workout done correctly with the GPS on a consistent. So basis. well, I you know I use the analogy when I'm training and I'm giving talks. I said if you want to see how well satellite works and you've got a satellite radio, drive into your garage. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I've got satellite radio in my car and it's constantly going out. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, heavy storms will cause that. Well, you know, listen, in my opinion, we're dealing with people's lives. Yeah. Sure. We need to have simple, effective technology that is highly reliable. Yeah. Is there anything out there that I'm going to say is 100% reliable all the time? Mm. Is it made by people or is it made by humans? Then it's yeah. not going to be in that category where that can be a guarantee but there are some technologies that are much much more reliable than others and i think what we use has been proven over the years uh and listen this didn't start when i started it, it this kind of technology is from world war ii yeah our enemies used to track each other uh through radio transmissions so I think it's proven itself in the fact that our agencies have made over 3,400 rescues without a failure. I think that says something about the technology and the training and the program, uh, which I'm very proud of. That's pretty amazing. Um, Just out of curiosity, whose who's permission is needed to, to put a tracking device on the, uh, on the elderly, on the resident, or whomever? The caregiver. Gotcha. So who you know, and we've even had seriously, we've even had some that had dementia that said, you know, please put this on me, I yeah. need it. Oh sure. Now, is that something that happens all the time? Well, no. But if you've got a caregiver that has some legal responsibility for the person, that that's who makes the decision. Sure. So who who is the the person that most often reaches out to Project Lifesaver? Like, is it a nursing home facility? Is it a caregiver? Is it the actual person, like you just said, in rare instances that needs it? Like, who's the average who's the average person or or company coming to you? The caregivers, and then I would say next would be uh, facilities that are members. I see. I see. Um, Wow, over three thousand finds. That's amazing. And where and where can people find out where you're located? Is it find an agency on your um, on your website? Yeah, go. They can go to our website and they can uh, click on where we are, mm-hmm. and it'll go down and it'll show you the agencies that are members. Oh man, and, and which it, one is the closest to you? Yeah, and I'm. We're going to put up your information on the screen because th- we do a video version of this, um, and we're also going to see if we can put up a a screenshot of where you guys are located because it looks like you're you're pretty much covering pretty a, much everywhere you left yeah. out montana well, you got to get on montana well, well we actually i think we do have an agency in montana okay. I'm, I'm not sure right off the top of my head where it is but i do know we're in all 50 states yep seven provinces in canada we uh, work with a government agency in australia and several uh families in uh, saudi arabia that's amazing. Uh, this is good work too because I, I, I think that people don't realize how often this happens. Um, but you know, it, we we only do nursing home um, litigation, and so we we see this on a frequent basis more so than your typical um, person on the street. But it's it's a it's a very good um, job that you guys are doing. We really appreciate that you're doing it, and that it's a nonprofit. Uh, organization is there a way that you guys get um, donations or funding from the public well we of course will accept donations no doubt uh, we've had some uh, Department of Justice grants that we've used to start up agencies and help equipment uh, help equip them uh, we have gotten grants from some of the advocacy groups where we've been able to provide equipment and transmitters and training uh, the bulk of our funding comes from the, the fact that we sell the equipment to the agency and we provide the training and we also provide other sort types of training to law enforcement such as alzheimer's dealing with alzheimer's patients dealing with autism uh, we hold a conference once a year for our members so that's where our funding comes from is there anything that you want to add that we haven't talked about already 
Well, you know, I'm probably going to say something now that's going to be very controversial to a lot of the facilities out here. Uh, we do that. We every, do have we do facilities that, that are members. <laughs> uh, facilities need to understand, and could, because we've seen it, and just based on the fact that you're talking to me, I think you understand. I don't care what kind of precautions these facilities take. These people are capable of and will get out. Right. I think they need to carry it to another level. They need to have staff and equipment that are trained. We even have school systems now that have come on board to be able to do this with autistic children. Good. Uh, the first line of defense, let's, let's face it, if they're in a facility, even if the sheriff or police have the equipment, the first line of defense is going to be that facility. And if they have the ability to lo- to track and locate one of their residents quickly, it makes it that much easier to control these kind of situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it starts with them, um, certainly starts with them preventing this from, trying to prevent this from happening. But in the inevitable situation where somebody is going to escape, um, it's good that there are other agencies they can reach out Two, like yours, because in my experience, these facilities all too often end up failing at preventing that resident from escaping. Well, you know, and then I I hear from facilities, well, we have alarm systems. Well, let me give you some some words of wisdom on how fast a person can be out of that building before that alarm is responded to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's great they have alarm systems, but I think they need to uh, take it a step further. Uh, after all, and I go back to what I said earlier, we're dealing with people's lives. We're dealing with uh, loved ones that care for them and have placed their loved ones in these people's care. Yeah. And I think everything they can do to protect that person, uh, they should look at. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you 100% on that. Well, Chief Saunders, um, this has been very beneficial for our audience, and we we really appreciate you coming on to discuss this topic with us, and most especially we appreciate um, your work with with the program that you started and your your service to the country and to the state of Virginia, and and you know we we're very appreciative of all those things. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate your saying that. All right, Chief Saunders, we um, we maybe have you again um, on the podcast, but we appreciate it, and we will. Um, I guess we'll we'll talk to you next time, I guess. Yes, sir. I'm available anytime. You guys have a great time. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Wow, it's a that's an amazing that's an amazing man. I mean, like, you know, first of all, let's just say it's not easy to be an army ranger. You know what I mean? No, it's not. It's yeah. it's very tough. Very difficult. That's a hard that's a hard thing to do. Then he yes. goes from there to, to, to state patrol or state guard. State yes. guard. Man, and then and then led led the SWAT team and and the, uh, the special operations capable unit of the, um, I guess the Chesapeake Police Department. I hope he doesn't get offended when we say the state of Virginia, because in fact, it's Commonwealth. So I don't I don't think anybody so, makes that distinction because otherwise the question to the the answer to the question how many states are in the union would be forty nine maybe unless there's other commonwealths okay we call it we it's the state of Virginia um, at any rate for, if for those of that have missed this um, the astute consistent habitual listeners of this podcast will realize that will is back (laughs) from his vacation in the south of france Uh just give us the number of macaroons that you that you ate all of them all of them um but we're glad to have him back um you know my voice can get pretty boring so it's good to have that is dueling voices that is true i wasn't i was just being modest i don't think that's true no everyone thinks so um but at any rate that concludes this episode of the nursing home abuse podcast there are two different ways that you can consume every episode which come out on monday mornings the first is through our youtube channel or our website which is nursing home abuse podcast.com where you can watch or you can listen on anywhere you get your podcast from so stitcher spotify itunes podcast puppy um wherever that may be Um, Check us out there. We are uh, appreciative that you've come this far and listened. And with that, we will see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the hosts or the guests, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the hosts or their guests and the listener. 
New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.